I will assume that you've heard of the pecking order. You've heard about that, right? Do you know how that actually comes about? It comes from hens, chickens, okay? And we're talking about the females now. We're not talking about the rooster, because the roosters have their own way. But this is how hens work, it is that they'll go and give a light peck, if you will. So, I mean, I would come up and just give you a peck, if you will. And, and if you didn't do anything, you know, like you weren't aggressive to me, I knew that I had authority over you, okay? So then I knew that I could dominate you. And, and so uh, hens go and they, they just check out all the other uh, female chickens and, and they look at, you know, if they're bigger, okay, I can probably just peck on that person and they'll, they'll go down. But sometimes they're going to have a, what you call a hen fight, okay? And uh, this is not pretty because uh, they'll go at each other and chase around and everything like that. And finally, one hen will subdue the other, and sometimes it's actually by sitting on their head and almost suffocating them, okay? And that way they have domination over the whole brood of chickens. Okay, so that's how it works. So you, you, we kind of live this hen pecking order, if you will, is that for all the kids who just started school their first day, that was a pecking order day because you didn't know the teacher maybe and a new teacher and you had new classmates, so it was a kind of a hen pecking day. And, and then of course, if you get a new job, you also have this thing it's like new work environment and then where do I fit in? So this is kind of a pecking order day as well. Well, the disciples were having a pecking order discussion. And before our gospel lesson is that three of them had been on the mountain with Jesus and he was transformed in front of them, transfigured, and that was James and John and Peter. These kind of the inner circle out of the twelve. So Jesus even had a pecking order for his disciples. And so on the road, they're talking about who is the greatest. Okay, so this is how it works. Now, uh, when I was younger and played sports, you know, it's like, let me be the captain so I can pick my own team because I want to win. And of course, who would you choose? You would choose the ones that were the best athletes so you could win the game. Well, one time when I was in grade school, Lutheran grade school, I just did the opposite just to see what would happen. I picked the least gifted, if you will, in sports, and I made all these kids feel happy, but we lost. <laughs> that was expected, okay? Because they had less talent than others who were more gifted. But we all have talent. Each and every one of us has a gift to be on God's team. And we are members of God's family, we're members of God's team, and we have an opportunity to use our gifts to share the good and great news of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus even gave a parable of the pecking order. Okay, and this is found in Luke chapter 14. When he had noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take a least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Interesting, is it not? Is that if you are a humble person, God will exalt you. But if you are a proud person, God will humble you. So I'd like to talk to you about the two marks of a Christian. Two marks of being great. It's humility and the second one is servanthood. That's it. Okay, amen, I can say that and you guys can go home, right? Nah, we, we're not ready to go yet. Okay, so let's talk, if you will, about humility. How do you tell a humble person? I mean, are they, like Donald Trump, humble, right? 
Okay, the, the code name for Donald Trump for the Secret Service was, you know what he said? Humble. Everybody laughed. Okay, uh, Jeb Bush says, my, my one is what, ever ready. Okay, he got a high five from Donald and a slap in the hand. I mean, so I mean, it's kind of funny kind of things as you begin to look at what is a humble person opposite of Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump is not a bad person, not saying that, but he's not a humble person either, right? You may be a very humble person. A humble person is a servant. A humble person looks and says, what can I do for you versus what can you do for me? So Jesus uh, said this to his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. That's a pretty humble statement, is it not? I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. They're going to kill me, but I will rise again. Humble and exalted by God. You see that? Humbled by human beings and exalted by God. That's exactly what God does to us as well. If we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. He will blow his own horn for each and every one of us, so we don't have to blow our own horn. Those who welcomed Jesus were Joseph and Mary, the shepherds, the wise men. Those are the ones we're told in Scripture. Plus, when Jesus was circumcised, a couple other welcomed him. As it says in John chapter 1, Yet to all who did receive him, you get that? To all who did receive him, and those who believed, so you got reception and belief. That's taking the gift that God gives to us, and faith is then emanates from us. So because of the gift that God has given, and because of the belief, is that he gives the right to become children of God. So we are all children of God this day. We are one family under grace, God's undeserved love. And children not born of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So what did you have to do to be born? Absolutely nothing. Did you get to pick your parents? Absolutely not. Okay. This is what God is trying to tell us, is that by grace and by grace alone, you are a child of God. You have received the gift of God's grace and God's faith. But there are those who are outside of the kingdom who do not believe, and that would have been King Herod and all those because they tried to kill Jesus. And John writes about that as well in chapter 1 of John. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, they did not recognize him. Because they didn't have faith, they didn't recognize Jesus. And he came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. They would not take the grace that was offered to them to have faith to recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior. Humility. In Philippians chapter 2. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's humility, that he would give up his life so that you and I might live forever. And then he gives them this, if you will, children's example. He takes a little child, he places among it, he takes the child in his arms, and he says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me, who does not welcome me, does not welcome the one who sent me. Is that yesterday we had itty bitty sports out in our soccer field. And that we who were serving yesterday had the opportunity to plug into children and to plug into their parents. To say, we are servants. It was what we could do for the families to help a young person see if they like soccer. Some kids excelled, some didn't, but we all gave them high fives and cheers when they kicked the ball into the goal. And so they all went home feeling good about themselves. See, we give 
what God has given to us. We give hope, we give love, we give encouragement as children of God. We should also have the same mindset of Jesus as it also says in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. You see, when we see people, we can size them up in two ways. What can you do for me? That's kind of the pecking order way. Or what can I do for you? That's the Jesus way. So you get your choice as how you view humanity. Is, hey, I th you know, at work especially, as a boss, I have to make you accountable to get production done. But it's not what you personally can do for me, it's what you personally can do for the company. Is, is that that is the bottom line. So I am a servant, you are a servant, and we work together to serve God, something larger than ourselves. So Jesus was not only humble, but he was also a servant. He said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And there's no greater servant than Jesus. I think we'd all agree with that, right? Now there are a lot of servants sitting in the pews today. There's a lot of you who are servant-minded. I mean, when we go out to the, uh, oh, lost the name, where the homeless are, homeless shelter, okay? Servanthood, when, when we're looking at, as a teacher, servanthood, Sunday school teachers, servanthood. When you're out in the community and you do something with another organization, servanthood is you bless people by giving of your time, talents, and treasure. Jesus gives us this example of servanthood to his disciples. From John 13, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to the place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you as an example to, that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The Garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but your will being done. Humble servant, that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what does this mean for you and me today? Well, first of all, is that when we look at people, we have to give them value because God values them. And the least in Jesus' day were children. It was, there was a pecking order. Males, females, children. And it went in that order. Who would eat first? Father, children, mother. Because the mother wanted to make sure that the children had enough food. It's not like what we have today. Refrigerators and cupboards full of food. They had to make sure they had enough to feed a family. And sometimes a father, being a good, gracious father, would have his children eat first, and he would eat then with his wife. But the pecking order was father, mother, children. Children were the least. That's why Jesus put the child in front of the disciples, to show them the least in their society in that day. Well, let's face it. Don't we like to be first? I mean, don't you want to be chosen first? Don't you want to be recognized as having some kind of talent, some kind of worth? We all do. We like to be first. We like to be recognized. And if you are recognized, that gives you glamour, power, and prestige. Things that are valued in our world today. So you women, how much do you like to clean up the kitchen after a meal? Is that your favorite thing to do? Absolutely not. Thank you. Absolutely not. How about taking out the trash? Someone's got to do it, right? 
cleaning the toilets, okay? Somebody's got to do it. So if you are a single person living by yourself, you're doing all three, unless you're hiring a maid. Okay. Now the good news is, is that in most kitchens we have a garbage disposal and a dishwasher to aid us. But it still takes someone has to carry out the trash and the toilets need to be cleaned. Now the nice thing is you can put these like blue things in your toilet. Hey, that saves a lot of work just as well. So when we begin to say there's a lot of servants if, and servanthood being done in a family. Now I can't remember any time in my life when I went up to my mom and say, can I take out the trash? Okay, can I wash dishes? Because in my day, we didn't have a dishwasher. I don't think I ever volunteered. I think my mother would have fallen over and go, Crap, if I would have said, can I do this? No, it's, it's your turn. That's how I understood it. It's your turn to wash the dishes. It's your turn to take out the garbage. It's your turn, actually, to clean the bathroom. I mean, all these kinds of things, because families have to work together. Well, when we begin to see Jesus, it's all about love, because that's what servanthood is. It's done with humble love. And Jesus says this, So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. I'd like to tell you the story about a king named Neb. His name was Neb for short. And Neb was a wonderful king in the sense of that he was rich. He had a great palace, he had a great empire, and he had great subjects. He had conquered a lot of people and a lot of territory around him. And one day while reclining, he had a dream. And the dream went something like this. There was a great tree that touched the sky and was as far as you could see from one end to the other. And in this giant tree was great leaves and great fruit. And birds nested in the tree and the animals below ate from the fruit as well. And all was well. But a messenger came down from heaven. And a messenger said, This tree will be cut down. And all the animals and all the birds will have to forage someplace else. But around the trunk will be a thing of iron and bronze that will encircle it and the stump and its roots. And then a messenger said something that startled King Neb. He said, you will be like an animal. You will eat grass. Dew will be on your body. Your fingernails will become claws because I'm going to give you the mind of an animal. And then his dream quit. And he was quite upset by this dream. He called all of the wise men in his whole kingdom together, the astrologers and magicians, and no one could interpret the dream. Finally, the queen said, there's still one guy that's pretty smart. His name is Dan. Let's see if we can get Dan in to help you understand this message. And so Dan comes, and King Neb tells him the story. He says, oh, king, I wish this was about your enemies, but this is about you. You see, you are the tree. And... The messenger said that the God Most High will cut you down. You have exalted yourself. The God Most High will humble you. He's going to give you the mind of an animal for seven seasons. And then you will come to and know that you have a right mind once again when you proclaim the God of heaven is the one who has given you everything. And when King Neb heard this, he was quite disturbed. A year later, King Neb is out there, and he's just looking over his palace, and he's looking over his grounds, and he's talking about what wonderful power I have, what wonderful king I am. And while he was saying this, he had the mind of an animal until he recognized 
the one who gave him everything. Now that story comes from Daniel chapter 4. You can read it for yourself. The one who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, continue to watch over us and bless us today. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. May we continue to be humble servants, growing in faith, growing in grace, thanking you for the gift of Jesus, Lord and Savior. Lord, humble us so that we can be exalted. Humble us so that we can be your servants. Humble us so we can serve our community and bring them hope. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen.